<laughs> All right, welcome everybody. We're going to get started. Uh, my name is Mark Zarefsky. I work in the Marketing and Communications Department here at Medill and want to thank you for coming out to Beyond the Box Score, a look at race in sports and sports journalism. Uh, it's part of Medill's uh, Gertrude and G.D. Crane Jr. Lecture Series. Uh, we have a great collection of sports, sports journalists here representing five generations of Medill alumni. Uh, their bios are included on your handouts, but I want to just briefly give introductions so you know who's going to be talking, and then we're going to get started. <coughs> My immediate left, uh, Kevin Blackestone. is a frequent guest on ESPN's Around the Horn and holds the Shirley Povich Chair of S in Sports Journalism at the University of Maryland. To his left, Sean Jensen, who's the Chicago Bears beat writer for the Chicago Sun-Times and has covered the NFL since 1998. On his left, uh, Ndidi Massey uh, is a former All-American softball player here at Northwestern uh, and currently is the Director of Business Operations and Development for ESPN Rise, which is the company's high school brand. Uh, next, Bob Eaton. Uh, is, has spent more than 40 years in television news and retired in 2007 as Senior Vice President and Managing Editor at ESPN. And last but not least, Coley Harvey is a Florida State beat reporter for the Orlando Sentinel and this past fall was one of 65 national voters in the weekly College Football Associated Press College Football Poll. So the way this is going to work, I have a series of questions that the panelists are going to talk about, then we're going to open it up to the audience for a little bit of Q&A as well. Uh, following that, there will be a little reception outside <coughs> where the panelists will also be available. On the back of the handouts that you guys have, uh, and you guys should have, or you guys saw before, um, there are two graphs that chart the racial disparity uh, in a variety of sports leagues as of 2010. Uh, there's also a chart of the racial disparity in newsrooms affiliated with the Associated Press sports editors. So my first question for the panel, uh, as you know, the vast disparity in races comparing the sports to the newsroom. Uh, what issues or obstacles, if any, do you think uh, develop as a result of this disparity uh, between sports journalists and the athletes that they're covering? And it can be open to anybody. Everybody looks at me. Wow. <laughs> well, first of all, I'll say that uh, if you work, walk in any press room in America, you won't see what's gathered here. This is, uh, this is an aberration to have uh, two black men, a uh, black woman, uh, uh, a man of Asian descent, and one white man. Uh, you, you don't see this. Um, and <coughs> I would also add that I'm sure you're referring to, to uh, Richard Lapchick's study that he does every now and then, um, uh, in which he gives out letter grades to, uh, um, in this case, the media in terms of diversity hiring. <coughs> I think he gave an F for gender. And I think he raised his grades to C plus for people of color, although I think in some categories uh, they were down, maybe in terms of editing, and in some other categories they were barely up. Um, and uh, I would just say that's a, <coughs> that's a real problem. It's kind of a roundabout way to maybe answer your question. But um, I would just say it's a real problem because uh, I think most of us here and maybe most of the people in this room who got into journalism got into it because it's a, it's a uh, critical um, endeavor in this country when you talk about democracy and, and uh, how viewpoints are formed about people. And um, I've always thought that, that, that sports is, uh, has been a particular prism through which different people get to view other people and different people get to view themselves. And uh, right now, with the growth of the internet and the decline of print publications, um, what you've had is a loss of, of interest and um, determination to try and um, bring some modicum of equality between people in the newsroom and the communities you're covering. Um, and as a result, right now, what you're finding is, is that media new media is starting to look like really, really old media. It's becoming uh, increasingly all white, becoming increasingly all white males, and as a result, I think a lot of the interpretation of what gets covered um, uh, is going to be um, distorted because of that. Just in, in my experience, I just, uh, I look at 
the, the importance of diversity among the people who are writing and presenting the news, I think it's, it's so important to people who kind of um, sift through it because you need that diversity of opinion. You know, and I, the practical experience that I lean on is when I was an intern at the Charlotte Observer. Um, during my time there, you know, I worked in, in news and also did some sports copy editing, but the, the rapper Notorious B.I.G. You know, had passed. And I remember I was sitting in on the news meeting and, you know, well, what do we do with this? And I look around and, of course, I have no say because I'm an intern. But um, so I'm basically just a fly on the wall. And predominantly white editors decided, well, it's not that big a deal. Most of them hadn't even heard of who he was. And so the plan was really to relegate the story inside features. You know, and this is one of the most impactful, meaningful African-American rappers of his time in Charlotte, which, you know, there's a large African-American population. And that just showed me at that point just why it's important to have, you know, to knowingly try to at least have a little bit of diversity so somebody could raise their hand and say, hold on a second, you know, my son loves that guy and, you know, this is, uh, we're making a mistake here. We should consider, you know, putting it on the front page in some capacity. And uh, the other practical experience I can think of is I, I've had the pleasure of covering a lot of different athletes. And uh, two of the ones that I've covered is Brett Favre and Randy Moss. And it frustrates me. Kevin and I were both columnists at AOL. But it used to frustrate me to no ends because they're very similar in sort of the things that they've gone through. You know, Brett and Randy both have had some transgressions. And yet, for all that Brett's been through, predominantly white media has given him a pass. Oh, you know, he, he endured that stuff. He's a better man for it. Meanwhile, Randy does things that were, frankly, less, you know, uh, hurtful and significant than what Brett went through. And yet everybody would constantly hold that over Randy Moss. And me knowing both of these men, I can tell you from my experience that Randy is a better person than Brett is. As crazy as that may sound to some of you guys out there, Randy Moss is not a bad person. You know, I mean, he's, you know, moody. He's got some issues. You know, he's, uh, he acts like a diva, but he does a, lot of, he does a lot of good things for a lot of people that people don't know about. And, and I knew about those things, and I, I often wrote about those things. So I always was very frustrated at how Randy Moss was portrayed and could never, ever, you know, shed that sort of tag of being this malcontent, jerk, you know, selfish person. And, and it's funny because, you know, the Vikings would win a game, and if Randy had three catches for 20 yards, he didn't care. Randy just wanted to win the football game. But, you know, on the flip side, if he had 250 yards and they lost the game, he was as upset as anybody else. And he wanted to catch, instead of 10 passes, 11 passes for 275 yards because he felt he could have been the difference in the outcome. You know, so meanwhile, you get Brett Favre, who really in many ways is so narcissistic and cares about, you know, how he's viewed and represented. And uh, I, I just felt his was a lot less genuine. So. That's something that kind of has frustrated me. So. Um, I, I guess I would kind of um, s agree with what um, both Sean and, and Kevin said, and, and that those who are reporting the news and those who are making the decisions of what's actually being reported, uh, it's really important to have a diverse group of people making these decisions. I, I'm more, I live in the content world at ESPN, but on the business side of the content world. So I'm more in meetings about not how, who's going to go out and be the reporter, but more so what's going to be presented, what's going to be on the cover of a magazine, w on a show, what's going to be our lead story. And it's, it's very biased. And um, a lot of it depends on the final decision maker, which in our world are majority white men. And, and then obviously with me being a woman, I actually, the numbers are worse on the gender side than they are on the race side. And so, and I'm kind of, I get the double dosage of being a black woman um, in terms of voice, in terms of um, contributing to, to what folks want to see and what news is actually being reported. So I, I just think we get better stories if we have a bigger diverse group making those choices as well as reporting. I think the stories are more well-rounded, and, and quite frankly, I think those two put together make stories more accurate. Uh, I wouldn't disagree with any of that. Um, I think it's, it's terribly important to have a diverse reporting staff. I think the issue is 
um, we need more diversity on the management level. And that is only going to happen when people like three, four of you decide at some point to stop being reporters and go inside and become editors <laughs> and become management and change the system. And you can rail about it, <laughs> and you can say that it's unjust, but until you do that, you were going to leave it in the province of white guys like me. <laughs> and, and he's done a fine job, by the way. <laughs> I mean, that's 100% that's correct. You know, I've, I've talked to a couple of mentors and friends of mine who are in the business, and they always say, Coley, would you want to be an editor one day, or, or would you want to do content and management? And I'm like everybody else, I want to report, you know, I want to get out there, I want to break the story, I want to write the story, you know, I want to, I want to follow in the footsteps of some of these, these colleagues I have here before me. But at the end of the day, I also say, you know, I do feel an amount of social responsibility because here I am, someone who is in a position to make a difference. There aren't too many people who look like me who are my age who are in newsrooms, you know. I mean, not just as we're saying blacks in general, black men in general, we're talking about young people as well. There aren't too many people under 30 who are, uh, who are working in this business. And so I, I have to take that into consideration as well as I move forward in my career and say, well, maybe, maybe someday I might want to listen to Bob. Um, something I wanted to touch on quickly that, that both Sean and Indeedy just pointed out was voice. You know, you, you, you talk about the fact that these athletes sometimes look at reporters and say, I don't look like you. You don't understand me. You don't understand my culture is really what they're getting at. Not necessarily race so much, it's more the culture. And you know, you look at the Michael Vick situation. Dogfighting is, regrettably, sadly, that is a subculture within a larger culture. And a lot of reporters at that time when all that was going on just really didn't understand it. You know, they really didn't have a good take as to why this, for some people, wasn't so important. You know, why it wasn't so, such a big deal to, to some people. I'm not saying it wasn't, I'm just saying that that other side wasn't necessarily told. And that's why you've got to have that voice to have people, granted, I've never really paid attention to dog fights like live in front of me. I've never seen it happen, but I understand them, you know, because I, I have a certain connection to that culture because of who I am, who my friends are, where I, you know, some people I know. <laughs> um, so that, that's kind of what I want to get at is just the voicing is, um, is as important as also the management and being able to tell some of those more diverse stories that we just don't, don't get a chance to tell. Can, can I just jump in here one quick second? I just wanted to say that there are some of us who actually chose the management side <laughs> and, not, and, and, and chose that for a reason. Um, and I, you know, for a lot of you that are students out here, I would say you should, as you graduate and jobs are harder and harder to find, is you should potentially look at that management side as an opportunity and not necessarily a plan B. It's, it's, there are great careers on the business side of the content world and media companies. So, it, I mean, I, I'm an attorney as well, so once I figured out I didn't want to be a journalist, you know, I went the next step, thought it, MBA, law, and, and knowing that I still wanted to be in the journalism world. So I think that that is an option, and, and again, kind of what you were saying is, the more of us that are in there, and hire the editors, and hire the writers. I mean, I can, tell you, I can tell you the group of black people in my group, I personally made sure they were hired. I called the hiring editors, and, and a lot of them are Medill alums, <laughs> and I said, you better talk to this person, and you better seriously talk to this person. And once the, our editors, once they were in front of our editors, they were so impressed, it, it, was, it was done. I didn't have to put any pressure on them, but I think the pressure is getting skilled, qualified, and experienced candidates in front of decision makers and getting them there, not as a token interview, but as a real interview when a job